What's up guys, Swift here wrapping up the final day of the Legacy Mock Draft full 7 rounds with 32 people. In case you missed the other videos, I did a couple of trades. I ended up with Broderick Jones as my first round pick. In the second round, I took Tuli Tui Pelotu and Keon White. Then in the third round, I landed center Luke Whippler and tight end Luke Musgrave. With the top pick of round four, it came down to running back Devin Ashane, corner Darius Rush, or one of the various pass rushers I liked, like Zach Harrison. In the end, I decided Darius Rush was too good to pass up. He could come in and be a day one starter at corner, and landing him in round four was just a big win in my opinion. Rush is fast, athletic, and he has the size and length to be a boundary corner in the NFL. I also saw just how feisty and physical he was at the Senior Bowl. A lot of corners had already went off the board, so I was really happy to get Darius Rush where I did, and then I hoped that an edge rusher fell to the end of the round for me. The edges I was eyeing the most got picked, Tennessee's Byron Young, Ohio State's Zach Harrison, Carl Brooks, and Isaiah McGuire all went before my next pick. It came down to my top three edges left on the board. I was leaning towards Louisville's Yaya Diaby, but I was also considering Michigan's Mike Morris and Clemson's KJ Henry. Mike Morris has grown on me a lot, and while I was leaning towards Diaby, Morris stood out when I was watching tape on Mozzie Smith, and he's a guy I really like. He also has better size to hold up against the run, and I thought he would pair well with Dominique Robinson. So I ended up going with Mike Morris, and then with my first pick of the fifth round, I felt like I had an even harder decision. Most of my needs had been met, and there were still quite a few players on the board that fit best player available. Ivan Pace, the linebacker from Cincinnati, Tank Bigsby, running back from Auburn, wide receiver Michael Wilson from Stanford, or I could even still get an edge like KJ Henry or Yaya Diaby. Even big D tackle Byron Young from Alabama was still on the board. I really like that guy. This draft is just so deep. I decided to take the guy that I think could be the best player available. He was awesome at the Senior Bowl and projects as a future starter at free safety, Christopher Smith from Georgia. My reasoning for this pick was that he was just too good to pass up. Also, with the makings of the elite secondary we have, there is one player that's much older than everyone else in our secondary, and that's Eddie Jackson. I think it's possible Elijah Hicks could develop into a future starter, but if Christopher Smith is still there midway through the fifth round, I would have to pull the trigger. I then was hoping that running back Sean Tucker from Syracuse would fall to my next pick. I think he's a perfect complement to Deontay Foreman and Khalil Herbert. However, he and a few others went ahead of a running back that I have ranked much higher. That's Auburn's Tank Bigsby. I landed him late in the fifth round, and he's a guy I love. He's a bell cow style of back who could be a three-down workhorse in the NFL. Landing him this late was a big steal to me. One thing that's easy to see in this mock, it's something I've believed all along, but it's hard to tell with mock sims sometimes. But this draft is really deep. I've said all along that last year's draft was one of the deepest in NFL history, which is why we were able to land someone like Braxton Jones in the fifth round, but this year's class could be just as deep or even deeper. The talent still on the board late in the fifth round was mind-boggling to me. Still so many guys I like, and not having a sixth rounder suddenly bothered me. I tried to trade down with my last fifth round pick, but nobody was biting. If I could have done anything different in this draft, it would have been asking for a sixth round pick or even two earlier in the draft when I moved down. They didn't seem as important then. Having one or two shots in the sixth round with this much talent left would be awesome. However, at this point in the draft, everyone was trying to trade down and nobody was really trying to trade up much. So I didn't get any offers worth considering, and with Tank Bigsby still on the board, I had to pull the trigger. And then in the seventh round, I was completely torn again. Still a lot of talent on the board for the seventh round. I was leaning towards Haba Baldonado, the edge rusher from Pitt, 
but I decided to pull the trigger on upside and go with BJ Thompson, the edge rusher from Stephen F. Austin. I wanted an edge with freakish bend and BJ Thompson just fit that mold perfectly. I also thought long and hard about Virginia receiver Dontavian Wicks. He was too talented to be here this late. I went with Thompson. I used my phone a friend on this one and asked Jordan T. Silvera for his opinion. He also loved Thompson's upside. He's six foot six with a ton of bend around the edge and burst. He does need to bulk up though. But since it was the seventh round, I chose to go for the upside. And then with my Mr. Irrelevant Jr. pick, at number 248, Jake Moody was already gone. I landed Virginia receiver Dontavian Wicks. This capped off an awesome draft for me and a fun draft weekend, but it did not end the festivities as next up, I had to gather my list for undrafted free agents. I put together a list of over 50 guys that didn't get drafted that I still liked enough to at least take a shot on. It's kind of crazy to me that there was this much talent still left. Even last year, there wasn't that many guys left after the draft. For my number one target in UDFA, I was able to land Washington's offensive lineman, Jackson Kirkland. He's six foot seven, 320 pounder who started at left tackle as a junior and senior and gave up zero sacks. He moves inside to guard this year for his fifth season and he gave up three sacks. I think he's a perfect player to bring into this offensive line room as an undrafted free agent. He was the top guy I brought in, but it did not stop there. There was so much talent still left. I had to choose wisely between offensive lineman targets like Dalton Wagner, Jake Witt, Earl Bostic, Luke Haggard, and TJ Bass, and then defensive line talent like Tyler Lacey, Lonnie Phelps, Brenton Cox Jr., O'Shawn Mathis, DJ Johnson, Robert Bill Jr., DJ Dell, and Teron Vincent. There were three safeties I really liked that went undrafted too. Trading from Florida, Chamari Connor, and Kavion Merriweather. There were a ton of wide receivers that had talent that didn't get drafted, like Jalen Wayne, Puka Nakua, Trey Tucker, Keteon Thompson, Jada Kiss Bonds, Demario Douglas, Darius Davis, Dallas Daniels, Michael Jefferson, Antoine Green, and Grant DeBose. There were also some linebackers I really liked, like Servakia Dennis, Anthony Orgy, and Jeremy Banks. Two running backs that I think definitely should have been drafted, Cameron Peoples and Daenerick Prince. There were some kickers, quarterbacks, and tight ends as well. The moral of the story was this draft, similar to last year's, is deep enough that there are going to be some really talented players, similar to Jalen Jones and Jack Sanborn last year, that slip through the cracks and do not get drafted. As far as undrafted free agency ended, after getting Jackson Kirkland, I was able to bring in Jalen Wayne, the wide receiver from Southern Alabama, defensive end Tyler Lacey from Oklahoma State, tackle Jake Witt from Northern Michigan, linebacker Anthony Orgy from Vanderbilt, quarterback Lindsey Scott from Incarnate Ward, running back Daenerick Prince from Tulsa, and then Shrine Bowl standout, guy who made a bunch of big plays that I really liked, wide receiver Jada Kiss Bonds. So on top of my 11 draft picks, I also brought in eight undrafted free agents. That's 19 total players that I brought into this Bears roster. I had a lot of fun doing this mock. It was a truly unique experience, and it feels as close to the real draft experience as you can get without being an NFL GM. This draft forces everyone to scout deep into the NFL draft and look for late round gems. One overall takeaway after this experience is I believe this draft is just deeper than last year's. That's very significant because I consider last year's draft one of the deepest in NFL history or at least recent history. So as a fan, you have to ask yourself how two straight drafts can be so deep. The answer is really simple. It's the COVID effect. The one good thing that came from the 2020 COVID pandemic was the extra years of development and college eligibility it gave out and how it's allowed so many players to develop in college and really stacked up these last two years of draft classes. 
I think last year's draft was more top-heavy, but this year's talent runs so deep, the deepest classes are defensive line and cornerback to me. In this mock draft, I made major investment into the trenches. I drafted two offensive linemen and four defensive linemen, and then on top of that, I signed two offensive linemen as undrafted free agents and another defensive end. That's nine total rookies in the trenches. Broderick Jones would be my right tackle, Whipler would be my center of the future, Jackson Kirkland I would move inside to be a backup guard, and Jake Witt would be a developmental tackle prospect. I added some weapons on offense too, tight end Luke Musgrave, running backs Tank Bisbee, and Daneric Prince. That would really make that running back room crowded, and then I brought in three wide receivers as well. Dontavian Wicks, Jalen Wayne, and Jadakiss Bonds. That's a lot of help that would be coming to this offense. And yet, I didn't forget about the defense either. I brought in five guys to rebuild that defensive line, but also brought in a young corner and safety to make sure the secondary continues trending towards elite status. Overall, I would give myself a B-plus for this draft. I tend to grade myself really hard. I love both Thule and Keon White. But in hindsight, probably would have taken Keon White first. I think I would have rather landed Keon White and Derek Hall in that situation. Also, a lot of fans have commented about the Pittsburgh trade down. One of the hardest things with these mock drafts is you have 32 people that are actually doing this. And future draft picks don't count. So we just avoid trading future picks because the drafts get reset every year to match real life picks to make it more realistic. So in a situation with that Pittsburgh trade down, I would have received another pick from Pittsburgh, but since it doesn't count, we just decided to wipe it off. Moving on, the Luke Musgrave pick was possibly my favorite in the draft. I don't think we needed to draft a tight end, but it was one of those picks where the value was just too good for me to pass up. Same thing with Christopher Smith in round five. Safety isn't a huge need, but bringing in someone who could take over for Eddie Jackson in a year or two could be really smart. I know a lot of you guys don't like mock drafts, but if you're still here at this point in the video, you're probably not one of those people. This is not a mock done from a simulated computer program. Every single pick was made by one of 32 die-hard fans of their teams. This mock experience was really fun for me, and I wanted to share it with you guys, but I'm not going to be doing a bunch of mocks the rest of this month. After my TJ Edwards video, I also took a day off from really working. I've watched so much tape I needed a break before I dig deep into more tape on these NFL draft prospects. I have a ton more videos coming. Please hit that like button for me, guys. Stay tuned. Turn those notifications on. I have a ton of actual scouting reports and draft positional ranking videos on the way. Until next time, bear down.